May it please the court, Isaac Ruiz Cruz on behalf of Mr. Jonas, and I'm reserving five minutes of my time for rebuttal, if I might. <laughs> on February 3rd, 2013, I, I checked with the local NPR station in Gainesville, and it was 36 degrees. That was the overnight low on that day. And I say that because there's an argument presented in the papers here, uh, and we've all seen countless arbitration issues arising out of the nursing home context, but there is a question presented here about whether or not Mr. Jonas had a meaningful choice. And it's our position that the record shows that he did not have a meaningful choice because his choice was between going back out to the street where it was 36 degrees, and the testimony from him was that it was cold and he was trying to avoid that, and having a warm place to stay, having some place that was going to give him food. This is a paraplegic Vietnam veteran who's in a wheelchair who's First of all, right before he goes to the nursing home, he's at the VA on the fifth floor in the psych ward because the police gave him a choice. You can either, we'll either help you be in jail or, or we'll Baker, at you, Baker Act you. It was, you know, one of those acts of Well, the arbitration agreement was optional, though, so isn't that his choice? He had no choice but to sign admissions papers, of course, but um, the agreement itself was an optional provision, as I understand it. You, you are correct that the language of the arbitration agreement says optional, but that is not the standard that this court has applied nor the other district courts of appeal have applied in the defense that we've raised. Obviously, the, it, I'm a professor of remedies, so it always I, I like to be precise with this, but essentially what the defense is arguing for is specific performance. I mean, that is what has arisen in our law about the enforcement of arbitration agreements, which is an equitable remedy. And so the equitable defense that Florida courts permit is one of unconscionability, among other things. And we've raised unconscionability. This court in Gainesville versus Weston set out the standard for unconscionability. And on procedural unconscionability, this court doesn't differ from the other DCAs. And that is, it's the method and manner in which the agreement was entered into. It's not the terms of the agreement that you look at for procedural unconscionability. It's the facts and circumstances. So while Your Honor's correct, that the terms of the agreement say that it was optional. That's not what you look at for procedural unconscionability. You look at the facts and circumstances. And the only record evidence is his testimony. And Mr. Jonas's testimony was that he believed he had to sign these documents in order to be admitted. Now, he, he had already been there for four days at this point. That's correct. So how could he say that he couldn't be admitted unless he signed these documents when he'd already been there four days? It's the, which is, just to be clear, the Romano case and the Wopsy case, in both instances, the procedural unconscionability there was the Fourth District Court of Appeal and the Second District Court of Appeal have found procedural unconscionability when the fact is that a resident has already been at a home for several days. Because then it, it's almost like a heightened expectation that you need, you, you're already there. He was, it's either the street or here. Now he's had a warm bed for four days and they give him the documents to sign and they say sign here. His testimony was that they pointed out X's where it was that he was supposed to sign at those particular X's. There was no explanation give it to, given to him about what arbitration was or about any of the documents. He didn't read them. He needed reading glasses. He said a little bit. He didn't have reading glasses. He testified that he didn't read it. He testified that he didn't understand it. So what I'm trying to point out to your honor is that if you look for parallels in existing cases, there's really three cases that you look at for procedural unconscionability. This court's decision in Weston and then the fourth dis district's decision in uh, in the Romano case and the second district's decision in Wopsy. And if you look at those particular facts, in Romano, the person was given the paperwork the next day. It was a separate agreement in a bunch of other paperwork, which is exactly one of the arguments that's been raised here. This was a separate agreement. In Romano, there was no explanation of the documents, and the person thought that they had to sign. It's the exact type of testimony that we have in this case. In the Wopsy case, there was uh, there was no approach until the next day, so the person had already been in the nursing home for a day. There was no explanation. The testimony was that the resident didn't read it, and the arbitration agreement wasn't highlighted. It's not something that the admissions director said, oh, this is an arbitration agreement. Look at what you're right. signing. But unlike in that particular case, the agreements in this case were actually separate documents or, you know, part of them were separate documents. So it's not as if it, the arbitration agreement was hidden within one master document. That's true. It's different than Wopsy in that regard, but it isn't different from Romano. In the Romano case, the arbitration agreement was a separate document that was presented along with other documents. And in this case, just to be clear, there is a 40-something page admission packet, and there is an optional arbitration clause within that packet, I think 30-something pages in, but there's also a separate 
arbitration agreement that was presented in some booklet that, that uh, regarding arbitration. So there are separate documents and there's also a self-contained document, but I don't, I don't think that's a significant distinction because of the fact that the Romano court found procedural unconscionability when they were separate documents. The only case then that's where there isn't procedural unconscionability found is this court's decision in Weston. That case was not one in which the resident, him or herself, signed the paperwork. It was a daughter. And that daughter had held an administrative position at a health care uh, provider. We know that as the education and experience, one of the factors that you can look at for procedural unconscionability, the person who's signing, what's their education and experience. And she, there's no testimony the court indicated that she indicated she hadn't read it or that she didn't understand it. There's no suggestion that it was offered on a take it or leave it basis. That's very different than what we have here because the testimony is that it wasn't read. The testimony is that he doesn't have an understanding of what arbitration well, isn't, is. Well, isn't opportunity to read it part of the analysis? Whether or not you've been given the opportunity Absolutely. to read it? Absolutely. Sure. Well, it's a, it's a multi-step analysis. And this court, as, you, as the court indicated, among the factors that, be, that can be considered, and then it lists three. And the three are realistic opportunity to bargain, present it on a take it or leave it basis, or a reasonable opportunity to understand. You don't have to have all three necessarily for procedural unconscionability. But is there really a reasonable bargaining that's occurring? Is there a meaningful choice when you have this Vietnam vet that just came out of the psych ward who has the option of being homeless, and he's being given this paperwork, and it's a, a bunch of paperwork being given four days after he's there, and he just he's oh, told I mean, signs. Was he he told sign. you have to sign this now, or you're, we're going to go ahead and discharge you right at this moment? He said he was. There, was there, are you saying that there was no opportunity for him to read this if he chose to? Because there's got to be at least some element. The record uh, doesn't tell us. And, and, and just to be clear, the cases that I just pointed out, like the Romano case, it, there isn't that affirmative testimony that someone said, you have to sign this or we're kicking you out in the street. Okay. This is just his understanding, though, is what the testimony is. He understood that he had to sign this paperwork because he didn't understand this to be, oh, there's a separate arbitration agreement, so he's contemplating whether or not to sign this voluntary arbitration agreement. It wasn't presented in that fashion. It wasn't explained to him in that fashion. I think that might be a different kind of a, of a context. He understands here's some paperwork. I mean, when you're talking about this type of an individual, that's, it's not you or I going in to, to buy a car and now we have to sign an arbitration agreement or go see a doctor and we have to sign an arbitration agreement now, like I had to do with my children when they were born. This is a different kind of a context. This is a Vietnam vet who's just looking for a place to stay on a cold night and he's there for four days and they give him paperwork. No one says, oh, there's this arbitration agreement that's going to maybe waive your rights. You should look at it. You should take a look at it. You don't have to sign it. There's none of that type of evidence here. It's just all this paperwork is being given. And to someone with his experience, with what he has, which is none with respect to this particular issue, he doesn't know what that is. He just thinks it's paperwork that he's signing to get the care that he needs. And that's what he testified to. He believed that this was paperwork that he needed to sign in order to stay there. And he was presented in his mind as a choice between these two things being on the street or perhaps going back to the VA where he was strapped to the ground as the testimony was because of his PTSD or having a warm place to stay here. That takes us to the second issue and that's substantive unconscionability. I think that from the perspective of where we are in the cases, the procedural unconscionability really is a less controversial issue than the substantive unconscionability, especially when you look at this court's precedent because you're presented with an issue that this court has not dealt with yet. And that is, with respect to one of the allegations in our complaint, we have a count for under Chapter 415 of the Florida Statutes, which is, in, in our mind, it's financial exploitation of a vulnerable adult. This is a unique case in that, and the record reveals this, the owner of this particular nursing home has been indicted by the Florida Attorney General's Office for fraud. And so we have a number of issues, and that's why we brought that particular type of count. I'm aware of this court's jurisprudence in Shands versus Bohannon involving 415 counts, but we think this is a different type of case. We pled that. And as a result, 415 has a fee-shifting provision. It says that if you're the successful party, the prevailing party, the court can determine that the other side is going to have to pay the attorney's fees. This particular agreement, however, whichever one of the three iterations you look at, they're consistent in one regard. We did raise the conflicts between the different agreements in our briefs. But they're consistent in one regard. It says that the attorney's fees will be borne equally by the parties. And the second DCA has faced this issue now three times. And in two of the decisions, they weren't in the nursing home context at all. But the court found that, that a fee-shifting provision like that, similar, had very similar language, where it said the parties are going to bear their own attorney's fees 
versus what the statute said there, and there it was a federal statute, there was a remedial statute, just like 415 is a remedial statute, that the agreement was rendered unenforceable by the, by the fact that the agreement was changing the fee-shifting provision that was found what, in the remedial statute. So you, you've pointed out that to the, I think it was the Florida Civil Rights Act that was at issue in that case, or, you know, which is a remedial statute, and that's what the court based its decision on, not one of unconscionability. And so is there any case, um, I know there's not from our court, but any case that it specifically held the, con the contract would be unenforceable because of un conscionability when there's the fee shifting provision. There is, and, and the difficulty is, and, and as an appellate practitioner, mm -hmm. uh, there's a per curiam affirmance from yeah. October 25th from the Second District Court of Appeals. I had it affirmed the lower court had found procedural and substantive unconscionability on this exact so issue. This is an issue of first impression, though. It's an issue of first impression. For, for all appellate courts in the state of Florida. For all appellate courts in the state of Florida on the issue of the nursing home context, whether or not 415's fee shifting provision allows you to have this agreement be rendered unenforceable. As I said, the second district didn't think it was significant enough to write about it, mm -hmm. but that's probably in light of their own jurisprudence because there are two cases, as I indicated, the Hernandez case and the Flyer case, that both have found, and it's not a very controversial finding, that if there's a remedial statute and it has a fee-shifting provision, if your agreement challenges that, that it's not enforceable. Now, what isn't, and, and that particular principle is not something that's new or a first impression. A case I argued to the Florida Supreme Court, Gessa versus Manor Care, was not the same issue, but in that there were arbitration agreements that had limitations, remedial limitations, on what Chapter 400 provided. Different statute, but in that instance, there were limitations on, on the amount of non-economic damages and the amount of punitive damages, not being able to have punitive damages. And the court found that those agreements were unenforceable because of those remedial limitations. This is a different statute, but it's also still a remedial limitation, and we think that it wouldn't be a far extension. It would be within, frankly, the umbrella of Gessa versus Manor Care, the Florida Supreme Court's jurisprudence in this area, for the court to find that this agreement is unenforceable on its face because of the fact that it has this fee, it, it contravenes the fee shifting provision that's found in Chapter 415. And that finding, quite frankly, can be made independent of the unconscionability context. This court can find that it violates the public policy of the state of Florida. That's something that this court can find. That's what, that's what the Florida Supreme Court ultimately decided in Gessa versus Manor Care. In the companion case, which is Clark versus Tandem, there were two cases decided on the same day. You raised the this court. pretty strictly as an unconscionability claim, though, as opposed we have. to uh, the, the, the provision is void against public policy because it violates the statute. We have. You know, we have the uh, Blankfeld case out of the second district that makes a pretty clear distinction between unconscionability claims and claims that they're void against public policy. We have. Is that going to affect? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, it, in all honesty, the fact that it's void against public policy on, it, on its face seems to mean that it would meet the substantive unconscionability prong of the unconscionability analysis. This court still would have to find that there's procedural unconscionability, but as I indicated, I think in light of Romano, in light of what you see in the Wopsy case, it's not too controversial a finding to find that this particular person did not have a meaningful choice. I'd like if to say- If we found, I'm sorry, if we found that, uh, that there was a finding of substantive unconscionability uh, as a result of this fee shifting provision, uh, but found that there was no, just bear with me, no procedural unconscionability, uh, wouldn't we still have to uh, affirm because, you know, it's a, they've said it, they're interdependent. It's kind of a balancing test. Sure, but here's the thing with these arbitration issues, which is why they keep coming back and back to the court. It's still a non-final order, uh, and, and this is one that the court could revisit, quite frankly, because the trial court could revisit because it would continue to have jurisdiction. And the fact is, if this agreement violates public policy, it's, it's not clear because no court of this state has expressed the opinion that the fee-shifting provision of 415, that that would violate public policy. So this court could say, look, we're forced to affirm because it wasn't raised below, but we still think in dicta that this would violate public policy and lay that type of analysis out. It could be re-raised to the trial court. There's no impediment to this issue being raised to the trial court saying, look, there's an expression now of this violating public policy, and we'd like to raise it now in the trial court, we might reach a different result. I agree that as far as the result of this particular case, this court's kind of stuck with the procedural unconscionability and substantive unconscionability analysis, but on a remand, the trial court could revisit a non-final order because that's precisely what this is. Um, and if I could save the last 40 seconds or so for rebuttal, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Marie Borland. I'm with the Warden Henderson Law Firm in Tampa, and we represent the Appali Nursing Home um, defendants. So we're hearing today that I guess when you're moving to um, compel arbitration based on arbitration agreements, you can't look at the terms of the agreements. And I've never really heard that argument before. But in terms of just going to the validity of the agreement, there are two claims that there was procedural unconscionability and substantive. And on the procedural, we've heard that it was um, you know, provided to Mr. Jonas on a take it or leave it basis, and he had no meaningful choice. And I, I really don't want to belabor that point. I think, you know, all throughout the documents which the court has read, he clearly had a choice. He did not have to sign these arbitration agreements. He could have X'd them out. He could have voided them. There were multiple escape hatches. He was admitted to the facility. He had a warm place to stay. It wasn't that he was thrown out because he didn't sign the admissions contracts. The question, as um, Judge Ray, you've noted, that it was whether did he have a meaningful choice with regard to the arbitration provisions, and he did. So unless the court... Did he know that he did? I mean, if he... If it wasn't convenient for him to read it, and it was a cold, it was a cold night, and he'd been there four days, and these pack, packet of documents was given to him, is it, is it incumbent upon him if there's a greater impression that it's take it or leave it? Well, Your Honor, under Florida law, that Florida contract law, you have to, you can't avoid a contract by saying that you just didn't read it. He had an opportunity to read it. There were plenty of people willing to explain it to him. I mean, there are just lots of cases on this subject that you can't sign a contract and then later say, well, I didn't know what it meant what I didn't read it. What evidence in the record that um, there existed plenty of people that could have walked him through all the number of pages at issue and explained his options? Is, is there any evidence in the record in that regard? Your Honor, I don't know that it was developed, but I don't think that's really the test. I mean, he said, I wanted a place to stay. I was homeless. I didn't really care. I signed whatever they gave me. I was of sound mind, I know how to read, I know how to speak English. There's no evidence to the contrary. And of course, Florida public policy favors arbitration. These arbitration provisions were very fair. They were very balanced. He had an opportunity to read them. He never asked the question. He never said, I don't understand them. And, and again, I don't want to use up the 15 minutes reading the, the contracts, but they're just replete with information that, you know, by signing this, you're waiving your right. This is purely option, optional. It is not a precondition to you staying at the facility. You can exit out. By the way, this isn't really the agreement. This is the agreement. I mean, it, it's all over the place. So I think the test is not who was there to explain it to him and, and what if he, he didn't feel good that day. I think the test under Florida law is you sign a contract, you're bound by it unless you know, it, it is an adhesion contract or you don't have a meaningful choice. And here, I think the contracts speak for themselves. He had a meaningful choice. I certainly would like to entertain any questions the court might have on those prong, on that prong, but I really would prefer if yeah, the court doesn't could, have questions to move on to the let's chapter Let's talk about four. the fee-shifting argument. Okay, so I went back and looked, you know, and I don't, this, this argument was not made, so it's not even preserved, but be that as it may, we're prepared to address it. Um, I mean, there certainly was one count in the complaint for this, but if you look at Chapter 415, we'll say this is a red herring argument, and, and really, the statute just does not apply. It doesn't apply for multiple, multiple reasons. One is, it doesn't apply to claims against nursing homes. So the statute itself says, any civil action for damages against any licensee or entity who establishes, you know, who controls or operates a facility under Chapter 400 shall be brought pursuant to Chapter 400. So in other words, this statute, which is to protect vulnerable adults by abusive claims by caregiver individuals, specifically says if you're suing a nursing home, you have to bring it under Chapter 400. And we know the Florida legislature does not provide for an attorney's fee award under Chapter 400. So you can't do an end run around the nursing home statute by bringing this new novel claim under Chapter 415. So it certainly doesn't apply to the nursing home, to the nursing home itself. So then we go to the actual claim that was made. What was made against Mrs. Hawk, I believe, was the only one, and as the caregiver. Well, it's clear by the allegations of the complaint, they're, they're making, they're alleging that through her administrative functioning, somehow that brings her within the purview of the statute. She's not a caregiver. So, in other words, there's no defendant in this case that would fall within the purview of this statute. So the court, 
There's no need to remand this for further development to the trial court. It just simply by its terms and by the allegations and by the facts of the case, it just simply doesn't apply. Another difference between this statute and some of these other statutes that um, the appellant has cited to, it says an attorney's fee may be awarded. It's not phrased in shall. There's no, there's no pure entitlement to attorney's fees under this statute. There's a clear difference between may and shall. So even if the statute did apply, it wouldn't deprive, it wouldn't violate public policy, or these agreements wouldn't violate public policy by depriving. Well, could you? I mean, say 415 does apply here. By simply saying that they may be awarded, is that not foreclosed by the terms of the arbitration agreement? Well, if the statute did apply, but I don't know that you would get to the point, though, of saying that those agreements are substantively unconscionable. Well, that's not my question. You're saying that it only says may, so there's really no entitlement to attorney's fees under the statute. There's no guarantee. Okay, but would the arbitration agreement foreclose any entitlement at all? Any, so it, it, anything that says that they might be able to recover attorney's fees under 415.1? Consistent with Chapter 400, consistent with what the legislature has said, yes, this nursing home arbitration agreement does not provide for entitlement to attorney's fees. So with regard to the argument I just made, it's not, it's one of many. It's not material. I will go back to, and, and Your Honor, yes, the agreement does not provide for attorney's fees. This statute says you might be entitled to attorney's fees. But I'll go back to the point, which is the statute doesn't apply to nursing homes, nor has there been a caregiver claim brought in this case. So the statute does not apply. Is that a, an issue that the trial court needs to determine? Um, in other words, are we, do we have to make that threshold decision in this particular case? That seems more right for a trial court to determine first, and then we would review it for error after the fact. Well, Your Honor, I guess you know we've this has been fully vetted. There have been two hearings on this. Uh, this was a count in the complaint. This is the first. The first we heard of this was in the reply brief. So I don't know, as a matter of policy, do you allow litigants just to go back and forth between trial courts and appellate courts when they had a full opportunity to make this point? And secondly, Your Honor, I would say this court, because it is in the pleadings, has been raised in the briefs, as a matter of statutory construction, can simply determine that this statute does not apply. And inter interestingly, there is not a case, as um, the appellant has conceded, there's no case applying this statute in the nursing home context. And for that reason, the appellant was forced to cite to the Hernandez and the fire printing cases, which of course are brought under the um, you know, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Workers' Comp Laws, the Civil Rights Acts, because this statute just isn't, hasn't been applied in the nursing home context. And here, I would submit that the appellant is really trying to do an end run around the nursing home statute. This is a nursing home case. The legislature has said that there's no absolute entitlement to fees in the nursing home context. We're going back to the enforceability of these arbitration agreements, or this arbitration agreement. There's no procedural unconscionability. There's no substantive unconscionability. This agreement does not limit non-economic damages, does not limit punitive damages, does not limit discovery. And so the only claim left is, well, it limits fees. Well, we know under 400, that's not, that's not anything that you're entitled to. So they have to pull out 415, but it's a red herring. And if we had had an opportunity to, you know, to brief this, we certainly wouldn't have to present the, this to the court for the first time right now. But no, I don't think, I don't think that the court is necessary for the court to remand to the trial court to vet this out just so that we come right back here and revisit the exact same claim. There was an argument made in the briefs, and I'm not sure if it was adequately made below, if at all, um, that uh, there was no meeting of the minds and that the, the terms of the different agreements were different. And the one that I thought was significant to the extent it's even preserved is the the differences between the guide and the agreement on the number of arbitrators um, that would resolve any dispute. So can you comment on that, why if there was, if that is before us, why that would not kind of render, be an essential turn and, and render uh, that there'd be no contract because there was no meeting of the minds? Okay, sure, Your Honor. And the case that's been cited for that proposition is the Basulto case where the court found in that case that there were two Def, two different arbitration agreements. So here you have two different, excuse me, arbitration agreements and their terms are different. And here, and I, and I feel that we've laid it out, but there's only one arbitration agreement. There's an, 
and, and here, if anything, the nursing home went above and, be, you know, above and beyond. Here in the admissions packet, there's an, an optional arbitration clause saying there's, you know, there's going to be arbitration unless you, know, you put an X and explaining in short form what that's about. And then there's another document, arbitration agreement guide and acknowledgement, that starts to elaborate a bit more, and I think that's the, the document Your Honor is referring to. But at the bottom, b before his signature, it says specifically, this is not the arbitration agreement. So then there's a third document, and it's the actual arbitration agreement, which is much more comprehensive. So as a matter of law, this court cannot declare that there are irreconcilable terms and therefore no meaning of the minds because there are not separate arbitration agreements. If there were separate arbitration agreements, perhaps that argument might be before the court. But again, this argument is based on the Basulto case and it's clearly different. So to answer in short fashion Your Honor's question, it's because there's only one arbitration agreement. Does the court have any further questions on any of these points? Thank you. Okay, well, I, we respectfully um, appreciate your time and request that you affirm the order compelling arbitration. I'll talk fast since I have 40 seconds. We had two 415 counts, one against the owner and the parent company, another against the administrator. I've tried 415 counts. In fact, this, this DCA has heard appeals on 415 uh, verdicts that I've gotten in the nursing home context. It's not something that's unknown. It's just if there's financial exploitation, abuse, or neglect of an elderly. Here we had financial exploitation. His VA benefits are being used for other things. As I indicated, the owner had been indicted for buying her personal car and doing all kinds of things like that with the finances of the nursing home. That's why we allege those particular things here. We don't think it's a red herring argument. The, the basic thing is he was given documents with X's told sign here and sign there. How could he have possibly known that what he was signing was this arbitration agreement and that he had some sort of meaningful choice. So because of that, we would ask that the court reverse. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to both counsel. We appreciate the arguments and the briefing. Okay. This concludes.